Television engineer Ralph Bayer had been toying with the idea of using TVs to play games since the early 50s, nearly a decade before students at MIT developed Space War, the first computer game. Now, the Bayer family had fled persecution from Germany in 1938, and Ralph himself graduated from the National Radio Institute as a service technician in 1940. In 1943, he was drafted and assigned to military intelligence in London. After the war, his GI Bill allowed him to finish his education at the American Institute for Technology in Chicago with a BS in television engineering in 1949. This was back when television networks only stretched as far east as the Mississippi, when there was maybe one TV set per thousand radios. So it, while it was a valid technology, it was still very much early days. Ralph worked for various electronic companies as an engineer and inventor throughout the 1950s, becoming very meticulous in his record-keeping and patent applications, something that would set him apart from the later pioneers of the video game industry, and something that will become very important later. While working at Laurel Electronics in 1951, he came up with the idea of using television technology for something other than broadcasts, and submitted a proposal for building a game into a television set. His superiors politely declined, and he moved on, but the idea continued to germinate. In 1956, he took a job with defense contractor Sanders Associates. By 1966, he was overseeing 500 engineers developing electronics for military projects, many of them incorporating television technology as the prices had dropped dramatically, and over 40 million sets were in use in the U.S. alone. While waiting for a co-worker at a bus stop, he began jotting down notes for the potential uses of the ordinary home television. The next day, he wrote up a four-page disclosure document describing the idea and the different kinds of games that might be played. This was centered around the idea of a small game box that might cost at retail $25, or $200 in today money. While TV game development was a far cry from Sanders Associates' defense contracting business, he had enough of a budget that he could stick a few engineers on the project after hours without anybody noticing. The first unit, TVG1, or TV Game Unit 1, used vacuum tubes to generate a small dot on the television screen that could be moved around using the standard diagnostic equipment used to align cathode ray televisions. Made of aluminum and glass, it formed the basis for everything that followed. By 1967, they'd created a prototype with several games called TVG2. As with MIT's Tech Model Railroad Club, Space War, the design lacked the processing power to allow the machine to control objects or display any kind of artificial intelligence. Their designs were all two-player games. There was a chase game where the players controlled dots trying to catch or avoid each other, a ping-pong game where bars attempted to deflect a ball bouncing around the screen, a game where the player shot at targets on screen with a plastic rifle, this worked very similar to later optical game guns, using a photoreceptor to detect light levels on the screen, and one where the player had to furiously pump a plunger controller to change the screen color. This plunger gave the unit its unofficial name, the Pump Unit. With a working prototype, Bayer revealed his project to the head of R&D, who agreed to a small $2,500 investment into the project. The goal now was to turn a metal box full of wires and covered in switches into an attractive and ergonomic consumer product. By 1969, they'd developed TVG7, affectionately known as the Brown Box, for the brown vinyl tape they'd wrapped it in as a faux wood veneer to make the game look more appealing to potential investors. Switches along the unit's front allowed different games to be selected, including checkers, ping pong, four different sports games, the light gun targeting shoot game, and a golf game. The development complete, Ralph dutifully applied for a patent and left the fate of the brown box in marketing's hands. As a defense contractor, Sanders Associates couldn't just make the unit themselves, they had to find a third-party buyer for the idea. They first approached the cable industry, and despite some initial interest, failed to find a company capable of securing the rights. In 1969 and 1970, they approached television manufacturers to show it off to GE, Zenith, Sylvania, Motorola, Philco, and RCA without luck. However, in 1971, a former RCA executive hired by Magnavox told the company about a, the device he'd seen, and they arranged for a demonstration. Magnavox saw its potential, signed a contract by the end of the year. They decided to call the resultant product the Odyssey. 
Under Magnavox, the Odyssey bulked up the brown box's seven games to 12, adding props like playing cards, poker chips, and plastic overlays that fit to the TV screen, held there by static electricity. The games included table tennis, a game that used paddles to bounce a ball back and forth, ski, a dot representing a player skiing down a mountain path requiring players to track their own scores and time, Simon Says, a three-player game where players race to touch the body part indicated by a drawn card. Tennis, like table tennis, but with a tennis court overlay and expected to follow the rules of tennis. Analogic, a math game. Hockey, another paddle game, this one using a hockey overlay. Points are only being scored if they hit the opponent's goal. Football, using cards, dice, and on-screen action to simulate a game of football. Cat and Mouse, a two-player chase game on a grid. Haunted House, a two-player chase game in a haunted house overlay, where a detective tries to find all the clue cards before the ghost catches them. Submarine, a two-player co-op game where one player is the sub, the other a torpedo. Roulette, a game played with chips where players spin the console wheel. And States, an educational game played with an overlay of the U.S. where the players read trivia questions off of cards. There was also a separately sold peripheral light gun, Licensed from a Japanese toy company that had recently developed such a device. That company? Nintendo. None of these games used ROM cards, but instead came as game cards, printed circuits, boards that plugged into the machine. The same card could be used for multiple games simply by changing the instructions to the player and what props they were instructed to use. It was released in 1972 for a retail price of $99.95, or... Almost $650 in today's money, five times more than Bears envisioned 1999, but creating the home game industry. Further complicating sales was the company's marketing, showing the Odyssey hooked up to Magnavox Television, mistakenly communicating to many potential consumers that the unit would only work with that brand. Famously, they would later bring a lawsuit against Atari on the grounds that their recently released Pong infringed on Ralph Bear's patents. Atari's founder, Nolan Bushnell, settled out of court, and in ten years, Atari would turn the tables on Magnavox, accusing them of infringing on their Pac-Man license with K.C. Munchkin. The wild success of Atari's Pong worked out in Odyssey's favor, however, perhaps saving it from an early obsolescence, as people bought the system just to have ping-pong at home. And that's the Odyssey.